think about like the eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. In a way, that that's sort of saying, hey, it's, it's crappy, we're going to die, so I'm going to do something directly opposed to it and just, you know, drink and screw and do whatever I can, right? And that, you know, then, then the death comes and in the last moment, you'd be, you know, I suppose you'd be kind of unhappy. Greg Sadler is a speaker, content producer, and author who makes complex philosophical topics accessible. He has produced well over a thousand videos on his YouTube channel. Greg is also the editor of Stoicism Today, a writer and a consultant. In this episode, we exchange with Greg about philosopher's will and especially Epicurus' strange will, which somehow contradicts his teaching. And you'll be very surprised about what the Greek philosophers has requested to happen after his death. We also share our own views about wills and also our lack of preparation for our own death. Please support the show by liking and sharing this episode on social media. And to make sure you don't miss out on any future episodes, sign up for our newsletter at deathandguard.com. It will also be a massive help to us if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, which you can do right now by simply clicking the subscribe button. Now, get ready for this episode, The Curious Case of Epicurious Will. Greg, welcome back. Oh, thanks for having me back on. Third time. What the hell, Greg? What happens to you? <laughs> yeah, it's a, a hat trick, as they call it in hockey, right? <laughs> You always come with a subject with the topics, actually. I like that because, you know, we don't have to think me and Keith at all, yeah. you know? And, and we like you because you have all these brilliant ideas and we're just like listening to you, you know, and we're just like, wow, this guy is so smart, you know? But well, you think that's the case, but I'm, I, I actually, I'm always workshopping these ideas. So I have them, I have some ideas, but I don't have them fully thought out. And I think in the last conversation, we were talking about legacy uh, you guys had a lot of uh, great, you know, things to contribute and, and gave me a lot of reflection. So I'm, I'm sort of tapping you, uh, all, not even a first audience, more like a, a set of consultants to bring in on, on this, this issue. <laughs> we will charge you, man. You will charge you so much. You'll see, you know, per hour, we are very expensive. Yeah, I shouldn't have mentioned the word consultant. <laughs> I was looking in uh, Diogenes Laertes, The Lives of the Philosophers, and uh, he also talks about the deaths of the philosophers. Some of them left wills, and there was, there was that, and then I was also working with a client on Cicero's um, On the Ends, and there's this discussion in there about why it is that, that human beings, you know, put wills and testaments together. And I started thinking, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while. Why did Epicurus have a will when he thought that once you're dead, you're dead? Why, you know, why do the Stoics, who are materialists as well, why do they have so much attention to wills? And, and I started thinking about, well, who else does? Plato, we know, had a will. Aristotle had a very famous will. And then his school, they, each one of them kind of followed along, I guess, since he, he established the, the pattern. We do have Epicurus's will. We don't have wills, as far as I know, for a lot of the, the Stoics, but some of them died pretty suddenly. Cato, Seneca committed suicide. We don't really know what they, they had to say about that. Epictetus, you know, he didn't write anything down himself that has survived, so we don't, we don't have uh, his will, but presumably there must have been something. You know, I was thinking, okay, if you're a Platonist and you believe there's a soul and it survives after death, that makes perfect sense. You, you care about what's going to happen to your, your progeny, uh, your household, but, or maybe you don't, you know, because if, if it, that, you know, the soul is what matters and the body is, and maybe you don't care quite so much. And Plato's is actually the, the shortest of these wills. Aristotle seemed to think in the Nicomachean ethics that the happiness of 
what happens with your descendants, it impacts you in some way, mm. even though you're okay. dead. Uh, not enough that like it would make, if you were happy, it would make you unhappy. Or if you were a miserable guy when you died, that somehow, you know, your, your kids turning out great would, would, would like make it all perfect for you. But he seemed to think it did something. Okay. And so I've been digging around and I don't actually have a, a, a well thought out thesis of, of any sort. It's more like a, well, this is what happened over here. and This is what happened over here. And, and isn't this interesting sort of stage in the, the research at this point? But it, I think it is kind of interesting to think about why, why did these philosophers think it was so important to put together a will? And there are some explanations. Cicero has Cato, who, you know, su sort of super stoic of his time, say that it, it depends on this uh, sociability of us uh, as human beings. With Aristotle, you can see why it would, would matter. The, the Aristotelian school puts a real premium on household management. So I guess you can see why it would matter for him. And then Epicurus is kind of the weirdest one, though. You know, he doesn't just set things up for his garden. You know, he had a philosophical school that he creates, and he doesn't just make sure that people are taken care of and says, you know, who, who gets to watch over who. He also suggests that they should do funeral offerings for his father, mother, and brothers, and for the customary celebration on the 10th day of, of his birthday uh, on the 10th day of uh, Gamelion in each year. And the meeting of the school held every month on the 20th day, which the, the contemporary Epicureans do to commemorate Metrodorus and himself. And he says, according to the rules now in force, you know, you, you don't want to disparage a philosopher, but he'd established something like a cult <laughs> a little bit. It's strange, actually. It looks like he contradicts himself, actually. Is it like a contradiction? Yeah. Your philosophy would say, well, it doesn't matter. And then, no, you have to respect exactly the rules. I think the way you put it is, is where the contradiction is. Because to say, well, so we, you know, we're not going to be unhappy or happy after we die because there's no us. That's the way the Epicureans think about it. That's one thing. Uh, and you can reconcile that with saying, well, there are going to be people left behind after me and I want to protect them. I want to take care of them. I want to manage my resources in such a way that they'll have a good life. That makes sense. But the, this has to be done on this, this day, that's a little strange. And so what could be the reasons for that? Maybe he thought that the, Eager. the well, <laughs> Possibly. I mean, it would, it would contradict everything that, he, that we know he was teaching, right? So I, I think we have to reach for other explanations before we, we you know, go to the easiest ones. Like, like, like well, he, he was just a, a hypocrite or something like that. But, but don't you think there's this, maybe, I don't know, a social pressure? I guess there's, there's what you believe in your, in your philosophy of thought and how much of the your social upbringing when you come to this kind of thinking about death, does it kind of, you go back to what you know best and I don't know, you go back to your old beliefs. I'm not sure. I don't know where I'm going with that, but how much the ancient thinking comes back? There, you know, there was all this mishmash of, of rites and cults and ceremonies and temples, not all of which was, you know, well-coordinated at the time. And Epicurus would have grown up in that milieu, so would have Plato and, and Aristotle. And they all have things to say about the, the gods. They all believe the gods exist. Epicurus just thinks they don't care about human beings, and that's why they're happy. The fact that they don't get mixed up with all the, what the riffraff are into. You know? they, they just enjoy a godlike existence somewhere else. So you're saying there is some sort of background assumptions that, that he would have reverted to. Thing we talked about this guy. I, I'm not. I don't know if you know him. This guy is Sheldon Solomon. Sheldon Solomon. No. He's, he's a psychologist, and he he, he has developed his uh, this theory about terror management theory and how much death. When you think about death, how much death makes you go back clinging uh, to your culture. You you become much more attached to your culture because culture is the only thing that will survive after you. The culture is, is your immortality. So every time that you prime mm. someone about death, you say, okay, think about your death. And consciously, <clears throat> you will get much more attached to your culture. So is it something like that? Because we are thinking about death, suddenly Picurius says, well, 
my culture is what's happening over there. So. There's something to that because you could say, well, what else survives death? You know, the school that you founded or your children or something like that. But those are contingent. I mean, even a culture could get wiped out, right? But, but, but a culture is much more durable than, than human beings like your, your son and daughter or your friends or this little school that you set up in Athens. So there's probably something to that. I, I, I wonder if, so the, these philosophers who are uh, not just doing it in an academic way, where it's what we call philosophy as a way of life, I would imagine that because they're doing an intentional way of life, they, they would be more liberated from, from that drive, but it could still be there in the background. But with Epicurus, the fact that he's already established his, this, this 20th of the month as the day to celebrate him and, and Metrodorus before they're dead. I, I, I guess you could say he's trying to create his own culture in a way, you know, while he's alive. And, and why is he doing it? So, you know, we don't, we don't really have that much from him. We have these three letters and uh, the principal doctrines and then, you know, some bits and pieces here and there with people saying this about Epicurus or that about Epicurus, usually derogatory because everybody hated the Epicureans. Later on, he assumes this kind of savior figure status in, in yeah. Lucretius. Lucretius credits him with being the person who like liberated humanity from the fear of death and gods and the afterlife and he's doing everybody such a great favor. Maybe some of that was there in his own lifetime and he he thought it's really important that we preserve this way of life, you know, having everybody think about me and my buddy Metrodorus once a month and get together and that would somehow preserve it. <laughs> I mean, it's back to legacy, isn't it? I think it's mm -hmm. it's usually the the simplest explanation is the is the correct one. <laughs> and even with the belief that it doesn't affect you after death, mm -hmm. it affects you while you're living. It's your sense of self. It's about how you want to live. So I think maybe for some of them, it was about you set the will up for what you feel about yourself now. It's it's about doing the right thing or managing things or looking after people, whatever your motive behind it is. Yeah, It's about staying in line with your sense of self as you're living now, as opposed to what actually, what, what actually happens afterwards. That's true. And, and so that I mentioned that passage from Cicero, it's from the on the ends where he's got, you know, different, um, figures setting out, you know, the Epicurean, the Stoic, and then finally the, the uh, traditional Platonist Aristotelian view. And, and Cato, who's, you know, the, probably the biggest Stoic in Rome at the time, he's got him as a character in there. And it's, very, it's toward the end where, where Cato's setting out the whole of the Stoic philosophy as he sees it. And he, he's talking about this, um, this sense that, or not sense, but the drive that we have for benefiting others, for extending our love or affection or care to, to others in, in these wider and wider ranges. And he says, this is, the, this is the feeling that has given rise to the practice of making a will and appointing guardians for one's children when one is dying. You know, it, it's interesting too, because I, I think that there wasn't a lot of, well, I should sit down, I, I'm perfectly healthy right now, but sooner or later I'm gonna need a will. I think a lot of these wills were written you know, when people were on their way out. Do, do we know actually when it has been written, this will from Epicurus? Is it at the end of his life or is it at the beginning? Do you no, know? we don't. Because, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's in Diogenes Laertes. And he was just much more impressed with the fact that Epicurus had this will and what it said than with giving us the, the circumstances. A lot of the other wills that we have are from him. So we have Aristotle's will, we have Plato's will, Theophrastus, who is Aristotle's, you know, most important student, and his will is quite long. Uh, and then Strato, his follower, and then, and then Lyco, all of them are Aristotelians. They do a lot of the same stuff in these wills. They dedicate things in temples, but it's very matter of fact. It's not like, because I love Zeus so much, you know, <laughs> I'm going to do this. It's more like, well, actually, there's, there's some where they're like, we're going to swap out this that, that we had in the temple put this in the temple now, you know, so it's very business-like. And then there's provision for children. Um, because they're, they're running schools, there's also some discussion about like who should take over the school after them. Very important for continuity. Although interestingly, Lyco in his will, it's either Lyco or Strato in, in their will. So we're talking about the uh, third or fourth Aristotelian scholarch, they, they actually say, ah, you know, put everybody together and let them figure out who the best person to run it would be. I don't actually know, you know, 
And then there's, you know, a lot of stuff about slaves. Interestingly, they, they free slaves and they give them, sometimes they remit their debts or they give them some money, you know, from the, the, the legacy. But at the same time, they'll also give the freed slaves slaves of their own from the household. <laughs> So it's not like free all my slaves, you know, uh, long live liberty. It's more like, well, this, this guy has been really good. So here's his payoff. He gets a couple of slaves of his own. There's, there's transferring of slaves, you know, from, from one person to the other. Is the, what they actually, they were teaching or their thought was aligned or were aligned with their will or the will were totally different, you know, from what they were teaching the will was, as we said, for, for Epicurus, was a little bit different or... With Epicurus, I guess you could reconcile. You know, he's got that line where he says, you can't live pleasantly without living justly and prudently and kalos, kalos which means you know, well or beautifully or something like that. And there's something kind of kalos or, or fine or noble about establishing and maintaining a school. I think that's kind of a... A cool thing to do. That'd be another way we could translate Kalos. It's cool. They do display a lot of prudence, you know, in the sense of planning for, for the future after they're gone. You know, you could think of a will. Why do we call it a will? Because it's a way of maintaining a sort of agency beyond our death, you know. I think, our, I think there's something in that. It, it, it is going back to the legacy thing. And it was interesting you said that uh, a lot of these wills are written when people were on their way out, which is slightly different to sitting down when you're nowhere near it, you're in good health and you're consciously thinking your, your motivation is different. Yeah. Is it on the way out? It's like the biological imperative is kicking in just that, that, that will to survive, to cling to life in whatever way possible. And thinking about your legacy, like it would make sense of uh, Epicurus and his dates. It's suddenly life is slipping away. How do I, even in my own mind, get a sense of it continuing. Yeah, that's that, that's that's quite true. Um, he was scared of death, basically. He was just scared. That's it. Mm. You know? So he started to cling. Well, and it, that biological imperative, the strength of that potentially overrides whatever philosophy <laughs> we have <laughs> when we're on the way out. Can it break that? I suppose it can if your philosophy is sort of like, think about it with a metaphor of like, um, water right so death is like a big storm front and 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 swell coming through the waves get quite big and they're going to crash against anything so if you set up your little house you know uh on the beach it's going to wash it away if it, if it's you know if you're opposing yourself to to the death if you instead dig channels um, you can direct that water wherever you want it to go so if you, if your if your philosophy is is essentially set up, think about like the eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. In a way, that that's sort of saying, hey, it's it's crappy, we're going to die, so I'm going to do something directly opposed to it, and just you know drink and screw and do whatever I can, right? And that you know then then the death comes, and in the last moment, you you know I suppose you'd be kind of unhappy. But if you've thought out what and this is. I don't, we don't really know that much about the Epicureans in this respect, but we know that the Stoics, you know, meditated upon death. They thought out, well, how am I going to approach my death? Is it really that bad? And, and when you do that, you're right. You get to the last moment that it might still fail. Right, you might have yeah. done it. <laughs> of course, but it, it 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 could also you know it could it could be something that I'm really mixing metaphors here, but it could be something that kind of harmonizes with it as well, and then you could have a a good death, which isn't going to benefit you after you're dead. Still, from a Stoic perspective or an Epicurean perspective, because they're materialists. Even Aristotle, you know, the uh, it's unclear in what sense the soul would survive in in any way once the body is broken down. It, it would lead to living out that portion of life that you've got in, in a way that's, that's good. There were some philosophers who, towards the end of their life, like in the Stoic school, there's a guy, I think his name was, was, uh, was it Diogenes, and he's called the Renegade, because towards the end of his life, he has a painful illness. And the Stoics had said, you know, pain, pleasure, those are indifference, you know, duty, that's the, the key thing, you know virtue and he he deserted that he said no pain and pleasure those are really really important <laughs> but it's interesting what you said Kiv, just how much can you how much can you stay anchored in your 
system of belief, like a philosophy that you just created. Yeah. When death comes in, you know, because this is very powerful. Come on. This is like, it's, we are wired to survive. You know, this is like our, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the limbic system, you know, the way that, that the brain is, we need to survive at all costs. You know, that's the most powerful emotion that we have, fear, you know. Fear, it's almost like all fears are fear of death, basically. You know, but we know that. We want to survive. So how much can you cling? How much can you be stoic? And again, uh, mm-hmm. when you, this happens, you know, even when you meditate. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just... I'm just curious. I don't have the answer, but maybe this is what you said, you know, Keith. Maybe it's just as simple as that. You know, you want to cling to life in some way. The, the clinging to life thing is there. And I don't think anyone knows when it comes. I mean, it's like death is the great level. So in terms of you said, all that beliefs, the way you live your life, when suddenly it's there, that's the ultimate test. <laughs> yeah. So, it, and it comes back to that whole thing about it's, it's like the the Bronnie Ray, the, the the five top regrets and stuff. It's like living a life true to myself. Maybe living a life true to yourself. I think in, in the very first podcast we did, uh, the guy we interviewed said it's like death is never a piece of cake, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I don't think it is no matter what you do, but I think it's about degrees. And maybe the truer you've been, uh, even things like wills, having everything set up and ready so people are looked after. It's just all about levels of peace of mind, I think, when you get there. And maybe the more uncertainty you've got, the closer you get, the harder that is to reconcile because it's that sense of things undone. I mean, you know, even if you have a good will set up, somebody could come along and administer it poorly or defraud you or you know, the government could come in and say, sorry, no will, you know, we're taking everything. Yep. So it's not, it's not a complete, you know, bulwark against contingency, but, but it's, you know, it's as if you can, you can set up one more thing and one more thing and one more thing. And yep. that peace of mind that you're talking about. But it's a sense of control in the moment. It's doing as much yeah. as you can. That's the thing. It's, it's even down to, it, it's, it's like some people who, customers who lose the rag and, and then it's, it's a case of they get a number or that they can go and make a complaint to someone. And in that moment, it's like, it's, I'm going to take this as far as I can. I know what I'm going to do. I've got a sense of control. And then you go home, you wake up the next day and you don't call the number because the, it's, it's the moment's passed. <laughs> Yeah. So it's up to a point. It's that death is the ultimate loss of control. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So actually for you, Greg, do you have a will? Sorry, I'm just like putting like... No, like... I don't. And I actually... <laughs> what the hell are you doing? You should have a will. <laughs> well, you know... Olivier, you know, do you have one? No, I don't have as well. <laughs> and neither do I. Look at the three of us. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is something that's... You know, Olivier and I were talking before uh, we began about um, try, trying to do a lot of things at the same time, have it, you know, having a business and doing, doing other things and, you know, how, how easy it is to get behind. And, and it's, it's been on the to-do yeah. list for, for us for years and we just never get to it. In part because it's, it's such a, a final thing. He's facing it, you're stepping forward closer into it. So I, I, yeah, I think I mean, there's, there's, there's an element of life getting in the way, but then there are other factors in there. Another factor is going to be, it's like the fear factor and the way the brain works. It's like, you're less likely to forget uh, about a concert coming up that you're looking forward to. You're more likely to forget about a dentist appointment. <laughs> it's just, you know, yeah, it's, that's, that's true. Yeah. I, I, uh, for me, it, it, it's, it, I don't know that that's the, the motive. It, I think it's more just general busyness. I've, I've dealt with a lot of deaths since I was quite young. My father died when I was 11 my mother died when I was 29 and I was, I was her executor and um, I've, I've been the family eulogist, uh, uh, you know, for my grandparents and that whole generation. Um, so, I, and I'm, a lot of people think that I'm, I'm far too flippant or lackadaisical about, about it, you know, that I, because I engage in kind of dark humor and, and uh, say things that then other people, you know, find a little insensitive. So I don't think that that's the issue for me. I think it, it, it really is just too much disorganized life stuff going on. <laughs> but I'm sure, you know, if you had a will, you know, and I'm just thinking out loud, I would have done this will for myself. I would say like normal stuff, you know, my possession, I will give my possession to my two kids. That's it. That's yeah. Thing. I would just do that. You know, it would be funny though to say, and I would like, like every year to this day, but everyone gathers <laughs> 
and do a we should, play, we should play a video <laughs> and play with death and girl to whatever you know just like having this kind of things you know yeah would it would it come to you like greg would you do this in your will you know just like having this kind of things you know, what would, you know you know, the, the reason really, now that I think about it, I, I really should put together uh, something like, not, not with, with birthdays or things like that. But, um, <laughs> I think where it becomes important for me is my virtual uh, presence. Because, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, in terms of property, I don't, I don't really have anything, you know, to speak of. Nothing that the state would be particularly interested in. It's not enough to tip over, you know, the level where we'd have to file a, a tax or a report. Uh, I think one of the main impulses for, for doing that, and I have to check on, on, you know, the state that we're in, would be to avoid having to go through any unnecessary things that would, would cut into the assets. But I think here in Wisconsin, if I die without a will, my wife just gets everything. And then that, and that's great. You know, that, that works perfectly fine. But if I care at all about like this little tiny digital empire that I've, I've created of, of videos and episodes here and there, then I probably should put some thought into what would happen with that. I've, I've actually in the past thought more about like, well, who would I want my books to go to? You know, are there particular people who would benefit from particular books? And I never actually got around to writing a list, but I, I gave some, some thought to that at least, you know, and that's a typical academic thing to do, right? So, so do we have a, a, an accountability thing between us three, like the ne for, for the next podcast, because now you're our recurrent guest, you know? Oh, so, yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we all have to have a will. Like for 2019, for the next podcast, we all have a will before. Should we do that? Like, that's like, actually a great idea. Yeah. I think it's a good idea. I, I'm a bit like you though, Greg, in the sense that there's, there's not a lot in that sense of, terms of assets and i was laughing sort of to myself when you said about the books because that's the kind of thoughts i've had yeah it's like who am i going to give my books and my music collection to and my instruments and i've thought more in that sense than 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 anything else but then it's also it's it's the other things like it's about it's about having things like burial money and all that True. kind of yeah, thing so yeah it's True. it's about people not going through any stress and even go, even down mm -hmm. to the uh, the thought popped in my head the other day it's, it's like i actually ha have it sitting in the house it's like my little death folder mm -hmm. which has here are here are all my this is where this is this is where this is this is where this is so when the day comes someone can just walk in and it's like no one's running around looking for things where's this where's that yeah, it's just that's... it's the ultimate sort of organization it comes back to it's almost like what was sort of going through my head was if if we focus on the end, and it's a bit Stephen Covey, it's like start with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. Focus on the end and have all that, and you work everything back from that. It's back to what Olivia and I's sort of concept around all this is. That's like focusing on our death will that will have a massive impact on how we live. So it's yeah. almost it, it comes back to that organisation. <clears throat> it's about what are we prioritising, what's important, who do we care about? Because when we go to that final moment, thinking about all those things. What's, what's funny about it is it's all really about someone else. It's all about other people, but it's about our sense of self that comes from that. That's, that's actually a great line of thought. So usually when we think about a will and last Testament, it's about, well, this goes to this person, this goes to this person, you know, have everybody celebrate my, my birthday on the 20th, you know, things like that. Right. Uh, and, and it would have been so helpful like when my mother died, and it was unexpected, she, she drowned. If there had been something like you're talking about, a folder saying, here's where this is, you're going to need to do this, this is the next thing you need to do. Because anybody who's an executor, you, you know, especially if it's for the first time, there's all these things that fall into your lap, and, and you know, you, you, it's like a, a, a whole set of tasks, and they, they keep multiplying. You know, you don't know what the disposition of uh, th that they want for them is. And we, we've done some talking, my wife and I, about what we want to happen with our bodies. Uh, we've actually floated a few ideas. I think I came home one time after listening on uh, some show on NPR, and I said, I'm going to uh, devote my, my body to, to science because then there's no burial costs at all, you know. Uh, because, you know, again, you, you, Anytime that you, you deal with, with uh, the funeral industry, you realize how overpriced everything is. And, 
and how, how little you're, it's sort of like weddings. You're really not getting all that much out of the ceremony for what you pay for it. I think this is that sort of gallows humor. I think some people may find that yeah. offensive, you know, and then, and then my wife said, well, why would you do that? Why not be an organ donor instead? You know, that way you can benefit other people. And I said, yeah, okay, that's not bad too, you know? And then, you know, one of the things that she did bring up is, well, you do want to have some place where your kids can remember you, don't you? And, you know, these are all sort of considerations that should be worked out. But then there's all the minute stuff like, here's the passwords for all the different accounts. That's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in today's setting, that's absolutely important because if you had to try to figure out what all of them are, or you have to go to the, the web services and say, listen, here's the death certificate of so-and-so. I'm, I'm the executor. Can you please give me the password? Some of them may do it. Some of them may not. In my mother's case, we, we had to track down financial information from somebody else who was long dead because my great uncle had this um, very nice practice, but, a, but one that was very counterproductive. Of, of um, He would take out CDs and put the other person's name on the CD, uh, you know, a certificate of deposit. Uh, back when that was a, a big going thing. And he would have his name and the other person's name so that when he died, it would go to them. But he never told the person that. And there were these CDs sitting out there in banks that um, the banks had never told people about. And suddenly it came up, you know, and then we had to go through all of that work to, to track these down, it's, to actually have all of that information in one place, uh, along with maybe some instructions not about, you know, do this with my body or, or things like that, but here's who you need to talk to about the apartment. Here's who you need to talk to about this and that. That would have been incredibly helpful. Can it be even more than that? Can it be like also thoughts? Because, you know, we're talking about preparation, like passwords, you know, possession mm. and all this kind of, but it can be like what I believe, what I think about, you know, you. Well, letters to people. That's that's letters. where I was going with that. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's, like, all, it's like, it, it's it's almost like a living journal kind of thing that it's yeah, like you're yeah. writing these letters and when it gets to the end it's like there's all these things for people so it's i mean it, it becomes a legacy thing almost as well so yeah. it, it's the whole the material things that live that, that get given to people once they've been handed over how long does the memory of that last whereas yeah leaving thoughts and beliefs and impacting people <clears throat> maybe in a profound way if 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 you you thought about it that it's it's about how you live on through how other people live is is potentially more more powerful we hope you enjoyed this week's episode again please support the show by signing up at deathhangout.com or clicking on the subscribe button on your screen